And I don't have a nifty outline this morning, and yet I feel like, uh, or this afternoon as it were, I don't feel like, uh, well, I do feel like this is what the Lord have us go through, but I don't necessarily have a, a particular outline. I'm going to read the first seven verses, and uh, we may go a little bit further than that, but uh, I just kind of want to look at the verses and see some things special in these. A lot of times when we go through a book, we skip a lot of the uh, first verses here, or the first verses there, and yet the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So I don't think it was the Lord's plan for us to skip over any portion of Scripture, though some of them you might know are challenging to understand. And sometimes you don't see the importance because, well, it's just a greeting. But then there's some there's some pretty good stuff in the greeting. Let's read um, down to verse 17, and we're going to try to come back and cover just the first few verses. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in his holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness and by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace, peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if by any means now at length i might have a prosperous journey by the will of god to come to you for i long to see you that i may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established that is that i may com be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me now i would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes i purposed to come unto you but was let hitherto that's one of those things where it's hard for us to grasp it, and I'll try to hit that before we leave. Uh, let's read that again. I purpose to come unto you, but was let hither too, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and the unwise, so as much as in me is, I'm now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray as we go through this greeting this morning, I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would convict us. I pray that you would shape us. I pray that you would make us more like thee, whether we could be better husbands, better wives, better children, better employees, most importantly, better witnesses for thee. Intimate disciples, Lord, that's our desire. Help us to diligently pursue it. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. What can you get in the first verse? What about the name, just the name, Paul? When we see the name Paul, what does that tell us about that individual? That's not, his, that's not what his mama named him. What did his mama name him? She named him Saul. Uh, I don't know why the Lord changed his name after salvation. Maybe. Kind of sounds like to me if you, if you read about Paul, even just in the scriptures, before salvation he had what we might call the little man's disease. Y'all know what I mean when I say the little man's disease? When Miss Janice raised her eyebrows and shook her head, 
Jerry had a pretty good guess. In all your days, Marlon, you never met a little fellow that was always trying to prove he was as tough as everybody else. That's the little man's disease, you know? I mean, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, so he went, all of the Pharisees persecuted the people that were believers, but Paul, he went out of his way. He, he, he asked for and got special uh, commissions to go forth and drag believers off to prison, seek believers killed. The scripture tells us that Paul held the jackets of the fellows that stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So he didn't actually kill him, but he was, he was agreeable with it. When we see the name Paul, honestly, to me, it screams of the change that accompanies salvation. Before salvation, he doesn't really want you to think of himself as small. The word Paul, they tell me, uh, it was a Greek nickname for someone who was short. Before salvation, he didn't want you to think of his downfall. He didn't want you to think of his weaknesses. But after salvation, everything in Paul's life was building up Christ. Hey, I'm little. I'm nothing. That, that name in itself describes that change that he wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, <coughs> excuse me, he's a new creature. Paul, he's saved. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant could have been translated slave. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. No longer was he a slave to his own pride, to his own arrogance, to his own... Uh, uh, a lot of people are concerned about, what is the word I'm looking for? Denise and I saw a pastor that just was a great man of God for years and years and years, and he became, became concerned with... What was the word he used to use? He became concerned with basically what people were going to think after he left. What? He became concerned with his legacy. And when he became concerned with his legacy, the whole ministry changed. The church had gone from 200 to you know over 400. And all of a sudden, the church is in reverse. Boom, it's shrinking because everything's about the legacy rather than the Lord. Paul, was, Paul he's, he's no longer concerned with his legacy. He's no longer concerned with his riches. He's no longer concerned with his, his testimony. It's all about Christ. He's a slave to Christ. That's what you say, that's not easy to do. Because, I mean, I, I'm going to have to be honest with you, Marlon. Sometimes I'm worried about my own testimony. My own pride gets in my way sometimes. So it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But if we tie this together with what we're talking about this morning, that, that intimate disciple is not concerned about his, himself. He's concerned about the Lord. So we see the saved. We see the, the surrendered slave. And then he says he's an apostle. What is an apostle? You can define it in a couple of different ways. What is the, the doctrinal definition of an apostle? People call themselves apostles today, but doctrinally they couldn't be further from the truth. What's the doctrinal definition of an apostle? He's one that actually walked and talked with Jesus. Okay? G I'm not to disrespect what you said, but to explain the difference. Jesus called me, but I've never personally walked with Christ. Okay? So Paul being an apostle, you say, well, Christ had already ascended when Paul got saved. It's true. <clears throat> but... He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And most people believe Paul spent, we know the scriptures tell us, he spent three years in the Arabian desert. And most people believe that Christ came back and spent that three years with him. Paul was the apostle born out of due season. There are no apostles since then because Christ doesn't come back bodily with us until he comes back in the clouds. We won't have that again. But that's the doctrinal definition. So John was an apostle. Peter was an apostle. Uh, had Judas been truly saved, he would have been an apostle. Uh, you had those 11 apostles, and then you had Christ. I mean, excuse me, then you had Paul. Uh, they, they elected somebody to the office there in Acts chapter 1, but God didn't choose him. They did. God chose Paul. Paul became the apostle. This other man was just another disciple. Okay? There's a difference there. But you and I can be an apostle in a different sense of the word. The word apostle means a sent one. And Christy is a sent one. Janice is a sent one. Nathan and Emma are sent ones. Do we always, like Brother Lamb pointed out yesterday, do we always surrender to that sending? Sadly, no. 
but we're all sent. The Great Commission was not given to the pastors. It was given to the church, to the local church. And then that local church started other local churches, and that commission went from church to church. That commit, If you're a part of the church, if you're a born-again believer and a part of the church, then you are a sent one. We see saved. We see the surrendered slave, and we see the sent one just right there. And what is he? He's separated. A lot of people are separated, you know. The Amish are separated. Monks, Catholic monks are separated. But are they separated to the gospel? That's where we have to be separated to. We don't have to necessarily be. It is true that we talk about being separated from the world. Look, I threw my hanky down when I took my jacket off. Uh, <clears throat> separated from the world, but it is just as important that we be separated unto the gospel, unto Christ, okay? Which he had promised four times by the prophet. He, what's he talking about? Well, most of us, including most preachers I know, can't necessarily point to it, but you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and I know I've pointed that out to you in verse 15. He talks about the seed of the woman, bruising the head of the serpent and the serpent bruising the heel of the seed of the woman that is the first first prophecy that christ is going to come for our salvation and yet we see him over and over and over through the old testament so this wasn't a new story it was kind of a concealed story in the old testament but it is a clearly revealed story in the new testament he revealed it aforetime by his prophets through the, in the holy scriptures Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, which is made of the seed of David. So <clears throat> we see that it was revealed through the inspired scripture. It was preserved <clears throat> and declared to be the son of God with power. According to Miss Janice asked me in, in the break time, what is the job of the Holy Spirit? One job of the Holy Spirit during the earthly life of Christ was to manifest the power of God in his life because he had willfully laid aside much of his godness and the Holy Spirit said, this is my, you know, descended on him. The Father said, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. And it was the Spirit that gave him the power to do some of these things. By the resurrection of the dead, it was the Spirit that lifted him up. By whom we have received grace. Now what's grace again? undeserved favor we have received grace and apostleship we have received God's riches at Christ's expense and the sending why 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 did we receive that well it tells us right there to be obedient we got the grace of God, and we are sent to be obedient in the faith among all nations. So whether we're in Bethlehem or Amory or we're over on Mount Zion Road or we're down here on, what's the name of that road you live on, Marlon? Timber Ridge, I know it was something Ridge. Whether you're on Timber Ridge or whether you're in Nettleton or whether you're in Timbuktu, which is a city actually in Mali, or whether you're in, uh, Isafirder or or Gardebay or Kopavogar or you're in Paris, wherever we are, to be obedient in the faith. Obedient in forsaken all. There's no place for for hiding. There's no place for well we hide. I shouldn't say there's never a place for hiding because the scripture actually holds some people in high regard who hid, but there is more important than the hiding, there is obedience. We have to be obedient in the gospel, okay? Among whom are ye also the called. So, Paul received the grace and apostleship for obedience in the faith, and we received it. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have grace for salvation, but we also have grace to serve, grace to surrender, grace to, I mean, don't you think it takes, don't you think it takes the grace of God to be the intimate disciple he wants us to be? I don't necessarily think that you and I could just muscle up on ourselves and decide we're going to be close to Christ. I think he has to, 
if we draw nigh to him, the Bible says he'll draw nigh to us. But we have to have his help in that matter. The grace and peace. Peace with God, yes. Peace with the world, yes. But peace with the world doesn't necessarily mean we're not going to have trouble. Peace in the world might be a better statement there. First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Man, I tell you, that, that, is, that is my desire for the faith of this church, the faith of the believers here to be spoken of around the world. And I can only think of, of two ways that could happen. Number one is in the event of some great persecution, I think our worldwide social media and worldwide media, CNN, Fox News, whatever, if there was some great persecution, um, I think that uh, it would be known around the world. The other way, which is much less painful for us, would be through missions. And that's why I have, I have, uh, I have emphasize missions during the time here hope to have a missions conference sometime in the spring and and maybe bring in some of these guys we already support but maybe bring in some new people so that we can empower them to preach the same thing we preach around the world <clears throat> making a request if by any means now at length i might have a prosperous journey by the will of god to come unto you for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. You know, really what he's describing there should be our desire for every time we come together as Christians. That Janice and Jerry are comforted by my faith. And that Christy and Michael are comforted by my faith. And Marlon is comforted by my faith. But likewise that John is comforted with the faith of Christy and Michael, Kendra and Chris, Marlon, Karen and Charles, Janice and Jerry, Brother Randy, that we're comforted by the mutual faith, by how we see the Lord working in one another. But if we come to church and we only talk about the weather and football and things of that nature, how can we be encouraged by one another, you know? Like just having that conversation about the scripture back there, that's encouraging because it lets other people know you're in the word. That's what Paul wanted to do. And as near as I understand the scripture, Christy, that's what we're all supposed to do. The Bible says over there in, in, in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, most people just take 25 and change it into a command. Forsake not the assembling of thy house together. But that's not what it says. It says you go back up to the beginning of the, it says not forsaking. Right? So that's an incomplete statement. It doesn't stand alone by itself. As for an English teacher, it's a dependent or a subjective cl subjunctive clause. The sentence begins in verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Hold fast. Hold it still, the profession of our faith. Let's not be roller coasters in and out and in and out and in and out. Let's hold it fast without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promise. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now, if I've got love, if you ask most people to describe God today, Miss Karen, they're going to say love. But if I have love and I don't have the good works that comes with salvation, that come with salvation, it's just another false religion. If I'm all about what I'm doing and I don't have the love, it's still another false religion. But it's our job, because there's going to be days when you don't want to love somebody. There's going to be days when I don't want to love somebody. Believe it or not, John loses his temper every now and again. There's going to be days when we don't want to do what the Bible tells us to do, but we come together so that we can encourage one another sometimes to say, you know better than that. I mean, Charles has said, you know better than this, John. We provoke one another to love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, lifting one another up. <clears throat> and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If we look at 2 Timothy 3, it describes where we're living today. Unthankful, unholy, disobedient to parents, uh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It's just like the church that Jason described in Sunday school, where they allow people who are known 
partakers in sins that the scripture says have no part in the kingdom of God to not only come to their church, we would welcome them in to hear the truth, right? But they allow them to take part in their church, maybe even speak in the church. Obviously, he was offended by that, and we should be offended by that because we don't want to take sin in the camp. We're not going to be successful in that. But we look at that, and that is a description. That church is a description of the last days when people claim to name Christ, and yet they are taking part in more things that have nothing to do with Christ than they are in the things that have to do with Christ. Another thing I think is pretty clearly a description of the last days is when we are all about our name rather than his name. Okay? And these are going on today, but we come together to be sharpened, to be cleaned up, that we might go forth to be witnesses for him. Hmm. To comfort one another. He talks about purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto. That's that phrase I said was hard for us to understand. Uh, this, the, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, only he that letteth now let, or something like that. He that letteth now let. But in the tribulation, he won't let. He'll be gone. So, Jerry, we use that word let in two ways. <clears throat> we use it. Rooms to let 50 cents. I know y'all remember that song, right? Two hours of pushing broom gets a four by 12, no, a something by 12, four bit room. Rooms to let 50 cents was the song. King of the Road was the name of the song. But so we use it, not necessarily today, but apparently 50 years ago, we still used it to mean we rented something to somebody. But he's not talking about renting something. The other way it's used is in the opposite. If my children, Bo asked me yesterday, may I do this? Yes, I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to allow you to do that. But this is the actual opposite use of that. And maybe I should spend some more time studying it. I've studied it enough to understand when it's talking about letting here, it's talking about preventing. The Holy Spirit has let, as in prevented him from coming to Rome to this point. The Holy Spirit now is letting or preventing evil from being as evil as it could be. But in the tribulation period, the Holy Spirit is going to be withdrawn and things are going to get worse than we can possibly imagine at this point. The only thing we can imagine is what's recorded for us in the book of Revelation. So the Holy Spirit's prevented him from coming. I wish that we could all say every time we miss church, it is because the Holy Spirit kept us from it hmm. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians the Greeks and the barbarians what are barbarians the Greeks would be like I'm a debtor Marlon to the English speakers because he spoke Greek so he's a debtor to everybody that spoke Greek which was most of the world that was educated at that point the word barbarian was an onomatopoeia. Do y'all remember what onomatopoeia is? Say what I just did, Miss Karen. I clapped. Clap is an onomatopoeia. Boom is an onomatopoeia. Zoom, zap. These are words that we produce to describe something that we heard. Barbarian was an onomatopoeia, meaning when a Greek speaker heard somebody speak something besides Greek, all they heard was bar, 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 bar. Could somebody, Emma, say John three sixteen? For God so. Should not. Mm hmm. Okay. Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son fils unique afin que quiconque croit en lui n'ait pas point, mais qu'il a la vie éternelle. The only word in that you might have gotten is eternal. But other than that, it's just it's foreign to you, right? And that's what he's talking about. So he's a, he's a debtor to the people who spoke his language and to people who, if you think that's bad, that was French. Fils vous êtes calé vous hémen at hand gav son sin en get en tout til des af fers en mal hand truer glatist eki helter havi a leaf leaf. If you saw that in writing, you could probably get a leaf leaf because it looks like everlasting life. 
But other than that, it just doesn't sound right. Sun uh, looks similar on paper, but it doesn't sound necessarily similar in our ear. It sounds foreign. Paul said, I'm a, I'm a debtor to those people who speak my language and to those people who don't speak my language. How is he a debtor? Because he has the gospel and they need the gospel. So he's a debtor to the Greek and the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise. In other words, a lot of times in Scripture, wisdom is Christ-likeness. But here, I think he's talking about to the educated and to the uneducated. But as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So I've preached to all these people who spoke my language, who didn't speak my language all around the world, but I'm ready to preach to you. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God. That word power is dunamis. It's the same where we get our word dynamite. When God's power comes into our life, boy, it, it makes changes. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. Because that's how God reveals it from faith to faith. I'm for gospel tracts. If you ever hear anybody say Preacher Hallman is against gospel tracts, they're lying. But it's not all about giving somebody a tract. We need to have a verbal witness. The scripture says that God reveals from faith to faith. Now I think God can take that with a piece of paper, though there are those who would disagree. Because somebody took the time to write their faith on that piece of paper and somebody else read it. But I think more often than not, we, they need a verbal witness from us. A verbal clarity witness. The churches right now that are growing, Marlon, sadly, most of them on this continent that are growing are not growing by seeing people saved. They're growing by the attrition of other churches. I asked Brother Faust, I said, are y'all going to en masse join another church? He said, no, we're just going to all go our separate ways. So then the two family, two, uh, two couples were there, and I think there might be one other couple. So the six people are just going to join various other churches in their area and of course I invited the one I know was reasonably close to us to come here but <clears throat> now I've lost my train of thought Lord churches are not growing by seeing people saved they're growing by attrition in other words they're growing some church is going to grow by anywhere from two to six members not because they saw somebody saved but because another church is going to cease to exist I don't think that's God's plan. Now, I, I, I can't imagine the, the, the mental and moral anguish that went into that decision. And I was heartbroken to hear it yesterday. And <clears throat> I could tell he was pretty heartbroken to give it. But I don't think that's God's plan. I think it's God's plan for us to live out our faith. There's a lot of talk going on right now because some changes are being made. And if you're in the employee of certain government businesses for lack of a better term um the supreme court has said you don't have your first amendment or maybe even your second amendment rights if you work for this organization you don't have the freedom to to speak your faith or to tear down someone else's faith it has been mentioned that maybe we just need to go out and have a demonstration the time may come for that but I think what is most important right now is that those of us who are actually trying to live out our faith continue to live out our faith wherever we may be found. And if that ends up with your preacher in jail, so be it. Because I'm not better than my Lord, and neither are you. I'm not saying I'm something special and I'm not trying to make a martyr of myself. I'm trying to encourage us all that we need to live it out. It's more about, yeah, we got it right on paper. I'm convinced we have it right on paper, but our paper's got to get into practice. Our paper has got to get into practice whether we are 
10 are approaching 70. Got to get it in practice. And I know we're practicing it. I'm not trying to say anybody in the room is not practicing it. I'm saying right now, persecution's coming. And we need to practice even if the persecution, or maybe I should say even when the persecution comes, we should stand. Wake up, stand up, and man up. That's what I preached last week. I know everybody didn't get to make it. But we don't want to make some fake presentation of our faith. Let's just keep living it and day by day, loving people because we are we are as much a debtor to those Spanish immigrants, Spanish speaking immigrants around here. We are as much a debtor to those who speak Ebonics that we can't understand. I stopped and asked directions once once in the Delta, and I spoke to the gentleman the way he was speaking to me. And when we drove away, Bo said, what language were you speaking? It was not a race. It was an innocent question from a 12-year-old boy. He didn't speak the same language we spoke, even though he would have called it English. I understood it because I grew up in Mississippi. And Bo now understands it because we've lived here a while. But <clears throat> we're as much a debtor to those people who speak different dialects and different, different I don't know, accents, whatever, and different languages as we are to those who have the same color of skin and the same zip code as we are. We've just got to live it out day by day. I feel like I'm rambling, so I'm going to shut up and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of 